So we moved here uh, to Wilmington in the fall of 2013, and when we got here, we did what most kind of parents do, especially when you're trying to make sure that your kids, kids land in a good way. We wanted to make sure that they kind of got plugged in in the right ways, and so we got them settled uh, in school in the fall, and obviously we got them settled kind of here at church. We wanted them to meet kind of some new people and be able to kind of build that community, but one of the things we also knew that we were going to do is we were going to get our kids involved in sports. Because sports had always been kind of a big part of our family and our kids had played some sports in different ways. And so what we did is we got our eight-year-old daughter signed up to play soccer in a rec soccer league. And this was going to be her first soccer experience. She had played basketball in the past, but this was going to be kind of the first time jumping into soccer. And we'd heard about this great soccer league. And so we got her signed up and we kind of started going to the practices and just sort of seeing sort of what the program was all about and learning a little bit more about it. And I'll never forget... Um, the first game, it was a beautiful, beautiful Saturday afternoon, and we had, you know, our lawn chairs, and we go out there, and we were sitting down kind of, you know, on this side of the field where all the parents are sitting, and the girls are warming up, and we're kind of exchanging pleasantries with these parents that we may or may not have kind of met before at practice, and then something crazy happened. The game started, and you would have thought it was the World Cup, because it was no longer sort of calm and pleasantries around us. There was like tension. The passion was high. Like it was really sort of thick. The pressure was on. And it was all coming from the parents <laughs> right here where we were, right? And as the game progressed, the voices were pretty much nonstop. If you've ever been to a game like this, you know, you've heard the voices. Maybe you've been one of those voices. I don't know. But it was, hey, 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 get the ball, get the ball, get the ball. She's open, she's open. Mark that girl, mark that girl, mark that girl. Shoot, 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 shoot. Oh, darn it. And it kept happening and happening and happening. And what was funny is the voices on this side of the field drowned out the poor volunteer gentleman on the other side who was the coach who was trying to you know, direct our girls in this endeavor. But the voices kept coming and coming and coming. And what was my favorite moment? Uh, was kind of sitting there, and there was this eight-year-old girl kind of right in front of us who uh, turned and yelled, Mom, stop talking to me. You're not my coach. <laughs> you see, this eight-year-old girl uh, was packing in that moment, I believe, some type of sort of emotional baggage. And I'm sure she had kind of probably been packing bags like that kind of all through her life. Maybe you've been that little boy or that little girl who, because of some sort of moment that you've been in, there's been a lot of pressure and there's been kind of some bags that you have developed. If you were here last week and kind of heard us start kind of unearthing uh, this conversation about bags, thanks for coming back. Uh, if you weren't here and you haven't had the opportunity to listen, we talked about this idea that as we travel through life, what happens to all of us is that we that there are things that hinder us. There are bags, in essence, that we pack. And I think these bags sort of, uh, they hinder us from the life that God has for us. There is a freedom in a life and a relationship with God that we have the opportunity to have, but, but all of this baggage can really, really weigh us down. Hebrews 12, 1 and 2 says this, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. And so the hope that I have is that we can throw off all of these things that hinder us, that we can see and identify what I've come to call bags, uh, and that we can deal with those and live into that freedom that God offers us. You know, what we want to do is to learn how to deal with it ourselves, and we want to learn how to help others in their lives kind of lighten the load, if you will. Well, this idea was birthed in me kind of several years ago, and I told that story last week, and I'm not going to go into that, but I will mention again that as I've kind of thought more and more about this over the years and, and really tried to step into what God's saying to me and, and, you know, to us about this, I've really kind of been saying, hey, like, what if our kids could go through, you know, their kind of younger years and not pack so many bags? If you're a parent, like, that's hopefully a goal that you would have is that they could go through their years and not pack these bags? Like, what would it be to be able to go through life and, and not be so weighed down by all of this baggage? Well, I think that is not just true for kids in life. It's true for us as well. Because as adults, we continue to pack these bags. I'm not naive enough to think that we're not going to kind of come out of our journey without some emotional baggage, because nobody, nobody can do that, right? But what if we as parents can do some things kind of along the way? 
to help our kids lighten the load. And if you're not a parent in the room, what if you yourself can learn how to understand the bags that you're packing and really, in essence, lighten the load for yourself? As this concept was sort of growing in me, I started doing focus groups with college students and young adults. And I would just sort of kind of present it sort of straight out. And I would say, hey, like, you probably have some baggage that is developing in your life. Tell me about your bags. And I was always amazed in these focus groups that I do that these kind of college students, young adults, would just unload on me. They would just sort of begin to talk about all the different things that happened to them in their life. And, and after kind of listening to them and reflecting on years of ministry, I've kind of identified what I call uh, eight common bags, things that are kind of weighing us down every single day. And, and as I started kind of stepping into this concept, I started doing a few seminars for parents to try to, again, help them sort of develop a preventive maintenance plan for their kids and, and maybe not have our kids sort of pack so many bags. And what I, would, what, what I would find is at the end of kind of the seminar, parents would always come up to me, like always, 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 and they would say, hey, like, thanks for sort of helping me think about my kids and doing that, but I need to like, I got to talk about me. I gotta talk about like my bags and the baggage that I'm, I'm packing and that I have packed over the course of the years because I'm not quite sure that I've realized how deep those bags are. I'm not sure that I've realized how much it impacts the people around me. And if, if I have kids, then you know, I'm not kind of sure how I might be passing on some of those bags. And we all have them. There's no getting around that. Some have you know, kind of more bags than others because of situations and circumstances in life. Some of us have bags over here, but not bags over there, but again, we just want to throw off everything. And last week, what I did is I, I told you that I began to think about a different target for my kids. I, I, I didn't necessarily just want them to be successful in life, whatever that means, but I wanted them to, to kind of have this new target that I want for you as well, right? Like, what if we could kind of throw off everything that hinders and live our lives in a way where we're healthy relationally, healthy emotionally, and healthy spiritually? Like, what if that's a target for us as we go through life instead of what the world often pushes us towards is this sort of worldly success? I mean, how would that sound for you to be able to feel like you could be healthy relationally, healthy emotionally, and healthy spiritually? How would that feel for the people around you, for all of you and the cloud of witnesses around you to do that? Like, if we compare accomplishing you know, the American dream and, and kind of getting more than we possibly need, kind of being successful on the surface, but really being empty inside. If we compare that with just kind of having what we need, but being healthy emotionally, spiritually, and relationally, like which one of those do we really want? And, and I can tell you what, what I think we really want. And, and remember, this is also what God wants for us. Galatians 5.1 says this, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. Like scripture says that we can be slaves to our sin. Scripture says we can be slaves to fear and I think we can be slaves to these bags that we often carry through life. Now some of you today might push back a little bit mentally with me and I'm, I'm totally okay with that. Like you might argue and you might say, hey, well, why can't we have both success and sort of the freedom? Right? Can, can, can we have both? And uh, I mean, maybe. But I do know that Scripture says you can't serve both God and money. I do know that, that uh, so often that is a difficult sort of uh, needle to thread, if you will. I was meeting with a friend a few weeks ago. He's in his 40s. He's a follower of Jesus. He uh, has been a part of our church in different ways. He's served in a lot of different places. And he said this, I guess I've always tried to chase being successful, but I haven't even really known what that means. You see, it's easy to sort of get, you know, sucked up and swept away by the wave of, of success, but we, we often don't realize that we're just going to sink in those waters because everything that we're carrying is so heavy and we can't swim anymore. Well, last week I talked about relational baggage that we all pack over the years, and if, you know, you feel like there's some relational baggage that you have packed and you didn't have a chance to, to kind of hear last week, I'd encourage you just to listen to it, and because what I try to do is I try to give you some practical steps of some things that you can do to, to kind of deal with your own relational baggage and some things that you can do in order to help people around you lighten the load. And this week, I'm going to talk about two more bags, and we're going to start with what, what is kind of one of my favorites, because in some ways, it's, it's uh, if I can have a favorite bag, uh, it's just a little bit comical if you step back and sort of look at the stories. The story that I told at the beginning is in 
sort of this direction. Um, but I will say also, it's a little bit, uh, it's, it's hard because it's tragic, some of the bags that we pack in this area. And it, it really does start at an early age for all of us. And one of the focus groups that I did, I was talking to a young adult, and, and he said this, the lie I sometimes feel is that I am what I accomplish. So I've had the privilege of coaching high school football for uh, over 19 years. I'm going into my 20th year uh, as a volunteer coach. I work full-time here at the church, but I've been able to kind of give my time uh, coaching. I started when I was a college student. We were uh, in, I lived in Raleigh. My high school was in Raleigh. Uh, I went to school in Chapel Hill, and I started as a college student where my coach for our high school invited me to come back and and kind of be a volunteer. So my sophomore, junior, and senior year in high school, I did that. Um, And then when I got through with that, um, I got hired as a youth pastor at a church nearby, and I kept doing that because a lot of the kids who were kind of in the school uh, were a part of our church. And so it just gave me an opportunity to be on campus and to kind of have an influence, Uh, and especially with kind of the the football team. And I ended up doing that for 17 years total. And... uh, (laughs) I took a couple of years off when, um, when our kids kind of were born, uh, and then we moved here, and I really, I thought I was done with coaching, right? I loved the opportunity to kind of be a part of all that, but I really thought I, I was done with it, but when we got back here, I had the, had the privilege to jump back in and coach for a couple of years uh, at what I think is probably the, the premier football school in the area, <coughs> Hoggard, um, <laughs> go Vikes, uh, and I really just enjoy being a part of it. And, and, and the program I was a part of in Raleigh was a kind of a high-achieving kind of program as well. I mean, we won a lot of games. We, we were really, really good. And so because of these years of experience, I feel like I know a little bit about coaching kind of young men how to play football. Well, when my son was in fifth grade, uh, and we kind of, again, we'd just been here not too long, uh, we signed him up to play Pop Warner. And again, at that point, I'd already coached 17 years. So, you know, I, I knew a little bit about football, but I thought my coaching career was over. I thought I was just going to be able to enjoy it, you know, as dad, kind of as I watched it. And so I remember going to the first practice of this Pop Warner team, and um, there were a lot of kids out there, like a whole lot of kids, like more than need to be on one team. And I'm thinking, how are they going to manage these, you know, 45 or 50, you know, elementary school kids on one team? And so the, the coach at one point, most of the parents were over there on kind of that side of the field. And I'm on the other side, uh, intentionally trying to stay away a little bit. But the coach jogs over to where the other parents are and kind of does this little impromptu parent meeting where he kind of begins to explain that, uh, hey, there's a lot of guys out here and we're kind of not, we we, we don't think we can manage them all. So we're going to probably need to break them up into two teams. And so if there's anybody that has any coaching experience, we would love your help. And I'm thinking, oh, no. And, and so I, I was going to call my wife, Karen, and I knew, like, I knew she was going to go, hey, like, we just got here. We're trying to get settled in. Your job is just busy. We don't really have time for you to do that. It's going to be great. And she said the exact opposite. She said, Sash, you have to do it. Okay. So I talked to the coach and began to kind of move into doing the paperwork that it takes to be able to get on the field. And uh, it, I could tell that these dads who were a part of it already, like they had a real program going on. They had been doing this together for a number of years. It was serious business. And after a week or so, kind of once I got on the field and we we're kind of trying to figure out what's going on with the teams, I realized that what they were going to do is they were going to create like an A team and a B team, right? Right. And the A team was going to be like the bigger, stronger, better players that were, you know, had potential to like win a lot. And the B team was going to be like everybody else. Oh, did I mention I was the only dad that sort of raised his hand? So they asked me, hey, can you be the head coach of the B team? Whew. So we, we kind of kind of go through this. And, you know, I know the A and the B approach is common in kind of youth sports. It can work. It's fine. Sometimes in football, it is a terrible idea. Because in football, when you have younger, weaker, not quite their players on the B team, in a league where there's no other B teams, it's all A teams, right? That team is going to get crushed. They're going to lose by a lot of points, which we did every single game. And kids can get hurt very, very easily. And I remember one, one day kind of before we got the team's Settled. I challenged them uh, about the plan, and it, it, they weren't going to budge. I could tell they weren't going to budge. And uh, at one point, one of the other coaches kind of looked at me, and he said, come on, man, we got to get these kids to Disney. I'm like, wait a minute. We're going on vacation together? 
Like, I, I didn't understand this whole Disney thing. Oh, but pretty quickly I learned that, you know, the Disney wide world of sports is where the youth championship of all things youth football ever happens every year. I made that name up. That's not the real name of it, but it's a big deal apparently. And the team across town had made it to Disney a couple years earlier. So like we had to get to Disney. And so as the weeks went on, I watched coaches push these elementary school kids uh, to near exhaustion every day, mentally and physically. And, and one night I was feeling a little snarky Uh, So we're in kind of the coaches group in a break, and I was like, hey, y'all know they still play with Legos when they go home, right? They're they're like in elementary school. They play with Legos. And one of the guys was like, ah, here's the pastor. That's pastor talk. I know I've given kind of two sportsy examples, but I I think what I'm talking about happens everywhere in life. The bag I'm talking about right now is the performance bag, right? We are driven to perform at every turn, and we drive others to perform at every turn, and I think it can absolutely eat us up if we don't pay attention to it. So the performance bag gets packed when we believe that what we produce is more important than who we are. When how we perform is more important than who we are becoming. Now, I know, again, some of you in the room are high achievers, and uh, you, know, you may struggle with a little bit of what I'm gonna say about performance, right? Because you feel like you know, you, you've had to perform at a high level to get where you are and to get what you have and all those things. And look, I, I work in a fast-paced church, right? And I do some consulting with some churches and I coach at the highest level of high school football. I understand what it means to have to be driven in performance. But the question I've started to ask over the last several years, and I think I would maybe ask you today, and again, especially if you're a parent, What's the cost for all this? Like the drive to perform, what is the cost for that? What are we willing to sacrifice along this path of performance? Because of this drive, we're packing some deep, deep, deep deep baggage. And we're passing it on to the next generation. I can promise you that. Because the reality is that kids, college students, young adults, and even thus as adults in the culture that we live in, we are growing up with some performance baggage that's enormous. We feel like we have to perform everywhere we go and our sense of worth is tied to what we do in life. In one focus group, a young adult shared this. He said, everything that is an output from a young person is tied to some sort of approval. Think about that. Everything that is an output from a young person is tied to some sort of approval. So we're living in this culture where we're being made like we have to perform in order to gain approval. We have to produce in order to be loved. We were at a school function for our kids a couple years ago, and one of the administrators praised this particular group of kids, and he said that they had allowed their achievements to simply become a part of who they are. So my performance and my achievements are now a part of my identity, which we'll get to in a few minutes. And almost every focus group, that I've ever done about this, college students and young adults have have quickly identified this pressure to perform as one of the heaviest bags that they carry. And one of the focus groups, this is is hilarious to me. One young lady said this. She said, I went to a competitive high school and there was a tremendous pressure to perform. I felt that at home too. I'm the oldest and as the older sibling, I was disciplined more. There were higher expectations for me and I had to set the bar for my sister's. Before she almost kind of got finished, a young man in the group who was sitting you know, over here, he says this, I had the pressure as the youngest because I had to live up to my brother. And then, like, didn't miss a beat, a third guy in the group said, oh, as an only child, I had a tremendous per- amount of pressure to perform because all eyes were on me. So three college students, all in the same focus group from very different family structures, have grown up in a culture we've created and they felt this Pressure to perform for years. And again, some of you might think, oh, it's good for them. They need to be pushed, right? It'll help them grow. It'll help them get better. It'll help them be better in life. And I would say maybe, I mean, after most of what I hear, it's killing them, quite honestly. After a lot of adults that I talk to, it's killing you too. It's just, you stuffed it down and, you know, you kind of have a hard time thinking about it and dealing with it. And here's a tension that, that I think we can sometimes feel kind of being even in the church. 1 Corinthians 10, 31 says this. So whatever you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. 
And we will all amen to that, right? That's an encouragement from Paul that sort of says, yes, we should work hard. We should do our best. But in what direction? Because I think oftentimes what we can do is we can forget that what what he's really encouraging us to do is to do our best for God, like in the direction of the kingdom of God where we can co-opt that really quickly and we can sort of put that into, hey, we gotta do our best in the kingdom of the world. What if we were able to really push ourselves to, to kind of do this, to live into this life for God while living in the kingdom of the world? That's what we have to figure out how to do. What if our energy... And our focus was on being the person that God has called us to be and and living that out each and every day in the world and not just sort of doing the things that we feel like we have to do to perform. Like what if we could really live a life worthy of the calling that we have received? What if we understood that we need to live from a place that comes from our faith in Jesus, not in what we feel like we have to produce? In Ephesians 5.1, Paul says this, we gotta be imitators of God. So what if we really wanna do that? What if we really wanna be the ambassadors for Christ that we're called to be? What if we really wanna be the light of the world, the light to the world, right? If we wanna treat others with the love and respect and the grace that God pours out on us. And this can even get tricky because sometimes we can think we have to perform for God, right? We can feel like we have to kind of go through our Christian checklist and we gotta do our quiet time and we gotta make sure we're consistent at church and we gotta make sure we're nice to people and we gotta make sure we give of our time and our money, and I would push back against that drive to perform just like I would a worldly drive to perform. Both of them can pack some incredible bags in us and can be incredibly destructive, right? Faith is all about having our life with God, right? It's not about what we do for God, but it's allowing God to work in us and through us so that that can have an impact on the world. Ephesians 2 Eight and nine says, it is, for it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. And this is not of yourself. It is a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. So last week with the relational bag, I mentioned what might happen if that bag gets packed. And so here are a few things that, that I think might get packed if the performance bag kind of goes deep down into us. We can question our worth very easily. Like if if we don't perform in a way that somehow we think we ought to perform or we perceive other people think we ought to perform, we quickly begin to question our worth. We develop a pattern of constant competition because we have to. We have to compete all the time because of this pressure we feel to perform. We can shrink back and lose self-confidence in a lot of different situations. We we can live in this nonstop pressure and anxiety, and we wonder why kind of there's an an epidemic of uh, anxiety and depression ravaging the next generation. I don't wonder that. I mean, I I think uh, it's coming from this nonstop pressure cooker that they live in. It's a never-ending pressure to perform, and uh, from from where I sit, it really kind of crushes their soul, and it comes from academics. It comes from sports. It comes from social media and friends and peers. It comes from their jobs and stuff that 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 generation can never get away from. Guess what? That's true for those of us as adults as well. Like all of those pressures that, you know, happened during adolescence that I think have ramped up during this particular sort of season of the world, we, we felt them and feel them as well. So what can we do? What can we do to, to hopefully um, kind of not pack these bags for kind of us to sort of lighten the load. And so some of these things might sound counterintuitive to, to you if, uh, if, if you feel like you have to perform. But what about this? What if we reduced the pressure on ourselves and reduced the pressure at home? Like what if you just sort of reduced the pressure on yourself? Uh, I was talking to a couple of different people in a couple of scenarios this week, and I heard them say something that they felt like they had to do. They were putting some enormous pressure on themselves about something that they had to produce. And I asked one of them, I was like, well, who, like, who told you you have to do that? And her answer was, well, I, I did. I said, well, do you really have to do that? Like, what if we could just sort of, almost sort of take a breath and recognize this pressure to perform that we often put on ourselves is not healthy, And what if we, if you are a parent or if you live in any kind of household with any other people, right, what if you were able to reduce the pressure in your home, which again feels counterintuitive if we're going to need to push everybody to be successful because that's what we feel like we have to do. But what if you just reduce the pressure on yourself and reduce 
the pressure at home. What if we do this? What if we just don't compare? Just, just don't play the comparison game, right? Don't compare yourself to other people in the world. Don't compare other people in your family to each other. Don't compare. I mean, we can play the comparison game all day long. And oftentimes what happens when we play the comparison game is either we, we're on the, the losing end of that conversation in our head. We're not good enough. We didn't perform. We're not worthy. It's just this, this bad place that we find ourselves in. Or we get on the other side of that coin and we're like, hey, I'm crushing it. Like, uh, hey, I'm pretty daggum good. And there's this sort of almost self-righteousness that bubbles up in us. Rarely are we able just to say, I'm good enough. This is good. I'm not going to compare myself to someone else. We're just going to not do that. What if we do this? What if we celebrate and praise godly qualities not just performance, right? When's the last time somebody told you or you told somebody else, hey, like you really displayed kindness and gentleness and self-control in that moment. Like I, as I was thinking about this years ago, I would consciously have to, after a basketball game, make sure I did not tell my kids, hey, like that was awesome when you got those rebounds and when you made all those points. What I would have to say is, hey, when that kid fell down and you picked him up, that was awesome. Right? What if we kind of went in that direction instead of celebrating their performance, right? Instead of saying, hey, I love how many points you got. I love, you know, when you did that. I love, hey, I love when you made that sale and you brought home that cash. That was awesome. I mean, you know, stuff that has to happen in life, but what if we sort of celebrate our godly qualities and push towards that instead of worldly ones? What if we remembered and reminded each other that our identity is not rooted in our performance, it is rooted in Jesus? Right, remind each other, remind ourselves that our identity is not rooted in our performance, it is rooted in Jesus, right? Who you are is not about what you've done. Who you are is not about what you've accomplished. If you go after kind of living that life and you accumulate some, some, a lot of things and you don't pay attention to this tension, you are gonna kind of build some really deep performance bags. And you're also gonna accumulate some bags in this last area that I'm gonna talk about just for a few minutes. And I just mentioned it, and it's the bag of identity. It's another kind of tremendous bag that I think all of us are packing. There's an organization that we have partnered with over the years um, here at Port City, and we certainly keep an eye on them because uh, they're, they're, they're great. They're doing a lot of research and, kind of on the next generation, and the research produces resources for churches and for parents. And for a long time, they've been saying that, that the task of adolescence kind of the work of growing up, if you will, revolves around three questions. And these three questions are this. Who am I? Do I matter? And where do I belong? Who am I? Do I matter? Where do I belong? All those are questions of identity. And I would say, yes, they are studying the next generation and trying to figure out how all of that impacts them. It impacts all of us who are adults as well. Who am I? right? Do I matter and where do I belong? We're all asking those questions at different times in life. I met uh, this kid named Sam when he was in elementary school. Uh, he, his dad worked at our church and was uh, kind of a little bit of a mentor uh, of mine. Sam was funny. He was smart. He was really the class clown kind of in every situation. Super fun to be around. And I started spending time with him when he was in middle school and I really spent a whole lot of time with him when he was in high school, he you know, did all the kind of youth groups every Sunday night. He was on all the mission trips. He was at the Bible studies. He kind of was on the ride. Uh, and, and he was kind of serious about his faith, but I always wondered if he had kind of just adopted his parents' faith. Uh, and he kind of felt like he had to. Uh, deep down, I could see that he just tried to fit in in every situation that he was in. And you could tell that that was important to him. Well, he was able to kind of be along that church ride for a number of years, and uh, his freshman year in college, he got plugged in because he went to school at State, and we were in Raleigh, and so he was able to kind of still be a part of the church, and we, we let him kind of volunteer as one of our uh, student ministry volunteers, and, and I could tell that he was struggling to sort of figure it all out. He, he pretty quickly got into the party scene. He uh, kind of stopped paying attention to schoolwork and his grades, he, he was drifting in kind of a big way, but you know, he was kind of all, all the while volunteering, uh, and I really kind of just wanted to keep him close so I could continue to have an influence on him, but there came a moment where there was kind of a pretty major moral failure, and I had to sit him down, and I had to say, uh, hey man, like, I love you, but you can't volunteer anymore. We need to take a break from kind of being a part of this, and that really, really rocked him. Like, he, he wasn't sure what to do next, uh, and I could tell 
that he was kind of struggling at a really deep level. And in one conversation, uh, he told me, he said, man, I just don't even have any idea who I am. I feel like that story plays out so many times. Kids, teenagers, young adults, and again, if we're honest, adults, we don't know who we are. We are struggling, uh, and we don't really have a firm foundation to stand on as we are figuring all of that out. We're bombarded with ideas and images and possibilities, and we don't even have the capacity to sort it all out, right? We don't take the time to really think about it and sort it all out. We sort of you know, let it go under the surface. We carry the baggage, and we sink under the weight of it. And one, one young adult in a focus group that I did said it this way, He said, we are forced from a very young age to develop our identity in several different layers. We're asked, what are you gonna be when you grow up? So we have to think about work. We have to decide about politics and uh, social issues. We're trying to figure out how we're connected to our family and how we think spiritually. You're often forced to make a stance on things that you have no idea about. Like the, the brain just at that age does not have the capacity to be able to figure out all the things that we toss on the next generation and we try to make them figure out. And that, again, is true for a lot of us. And add on that the layer of having to figure out sexuality at such an early age. And no wonder kids and teenagers and young adults are really just cracking under the pressure of identity. One college student said it this way. He said, when you pick an identity, you can feel like you're stuck and there's no way out. So when it comes to identity, I mean, you know, we all wonder things like, am I just the sum of what I have accomplished? Like, is that all I am? Like, stack up everything I've done, and I'm the sum of that. Or on the other side of that coin, am I just the sum of all of my failures? Do I just kind of fall into that hole and believe that's who I am? It's either about my performance or my lack of performance, and it all wraps into our identity. How often do we get to a place where we can just say, I've done enough? And I am enough. Well, if this bag gets packed, the bag of identity, if it gets packed, here are a couple things that, you know, might happen, right? We can have a a real deflated sense of self that can kind of permeate all areas of our life. We can build an identity on a false foundation that cannot last. We can question our identity in Christ and we can struggle at the end of the day to even trust God. Well, a couple things really quickly to do, and then we're gonna wrap up this conversation. A couple things maybe to do, you know, if, if there's some identity baggage that is bubbled up in you. What if we just affirm and teach identity in Christ, right, to yourself and to others, right? As we seek to live into our own identity, we have the opportunity, you know, to remind ourselves who we really are. We have the opportunity every day to to point ourselves, to point our own mind, to be transformed by the renewing of our mind and step into this identity in Christ. And then if we can sort of keep affirming that in ourself, if we can believe that ourself, we can establish that identity, then we can step into helping other people do the same. Like what if our goal in, you know, with people around us was to help them affirm their identity in Christ? Not their identity as an athlete, not their identity as a great salesman, not their identity as an awesome student, and I could go on and on and on, but what if we affirm and teach identity in Christ in yourself and others? I think that sounds um, relationally, emotionally, and spiritually healthy. Life's not gonna be perfect if we can do all that. But what if we kind of remind ourselves of all of these things, right? What if we remind ourselves, I am a child of God. I am fully approved, fully accepted, and fully loved by God. I am a beloved child of my parents. Like some of us as as adults need to hopefully feel that. And certainly if you're a parent, your kids need to hear that and feel that. I get to be a part of a much bigger plan. I was created for a purpose. I am uniquely gifted by God. I have a future and God is always with me. That's affirming and teaching identity in Christ. And then what if you surround yourself with people, other people that will affirm your identity in Christ, right? Not just people who are gonna push you to perform, 
But what if you surround yourself with people like this cloud of witnesses that we all have the opportunity to be a part of? Surround yourself with people that are going to push you in that direction, right? Proverbs says, he who walks with the wise grows wise, but a companion of fools suffers harm. The way we often say it to teenagers is your friends will determine the quality and direction of your life. Right? What if we, 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 we become the people and we surround ourselves with people that will affirm identity in Christ, not just push us to perform? This is life with God together. It really is. When we surround ourselves with people who are going to just push us towards worldly accomplishments, guess where we're probably going to go? But if we can kind of be the cloud of witnesses and surround ourselves with people that are going to affirm our identity in Christ, uh, I think a lot of things are going to change. Here's how we're going to close this, uh, this conversation for a couple weeks. You know, there's a song by Hillsong United, um, and it, it has a line in it that says, your love is too good to leave me here. Right, we, we've un, if you've been listening for a couple weeks or even just today, like some things may have stirred in you that are painful. I mean, look, I, I'm kind of typically a, an optimistic kind of guy, sort of having to have a conversation about baggage does not come naturally to me, doesn't always feel good to be in this setting doing that. However, I do know we serve a God who's bigger than our bags, right? And, and his love doesn't want to leave us there, right? That's not where we want to stay is in our baggage because we can all struggle under the weight and the burden of that. But God is in the transformation business, right? He doesn't want us to stay stuck. He wants for us to move. He wants for us to grow. He wants for us to go deeper in him. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 5, he says, you know, we're a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. Philippians 1 says that he who began a good work in us will see it through to completion. And I've talked about Hebrews for the last couple of weeks where, where, where Jesus is the author and perfecter of our faith. And so we have to be reminded that God is working in us. It's a process, it's a journey. And we can, with the power of the Holy Spirit, be transformed. We can change the patterns uh, that we have in our mind. We can think differently. Uh, we can have a different attitude and we can live in a freedom that God offers to us even in the midst of knowing that we have a lot of baggage because as I said last week, it's okay to have baggage. It's just not okay to live from that baggage. So here's how we're gonna close today a little bit differently. Um, if, if God is kind of moving in you and, and there's some relational baggage, there's some performance baggage, identity baggage, there's you know, a bunch more bags that we pack. If any of that is kind of, kind of welling up in you and you just need to, to sit in it for a minute with God, we wanna kind of give you the chance to do that. So what I'm gonna do is I'm, I'm gonna just ask all of us to kind of close our eyes. You can put your head down. If, if you kind of feel led to put your hands out in a symbolic gesture of releasing anything to God, you can do that. And I'm gonna read a prayer that I found. It's called the Prayer of Release that speaks specifically to uh, what I've been talking about for a couple weeks. And then I'm gonna give us you know, 30 seconds or so just to, to think and to pray on our own. And then I'm gonna read something from Ephesians uh, chapter three. This is a kind of a direct prayer from Paul uh, to the church in Ephesus, but I think it, it very much applies to us. So as we think about our bags, let's pray. Heavenly Father, I release to you the burdens that I have been carrying, burdens that you never intended for me to carry. I cast all of my cares on you, all my worries, all my fears. You have told me not to be anxious about anything, but rather to bring everything to you in prayer with thankfulness. Father, calm my restless spirit, quiet my anxious heart, still my troubling thoughts with the assurance that you are in control. I let go of my grip upon the things that I've been hanging on to. With open hands, I come to you. I release to your will all that I am trying to manipulate. I release to your authority all that I am trying to control. I release to your timing all that I have been striving to make happen. I thank you for your promise to sustain me, preserve me, and guard all that I have entrusted to your keeping. Protect my heart and mind with your peace, the peace that passes all understanding. Father, may your will be done in my life, in your time, 
and in your way. Ephesians chapter 3, verses 14 to 21. For this reason, I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and how long and how deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all of the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Sass. Thank you, church. That was such a powerful way to conclude what Sass has been leading us through the past couple weeks. And I just want you to know, whether you're watching online right now or whether you're in the room today, if, if this is feeling heavy, if this is feeling like I need to bring somebody into this conversation, it would be an honor and it would be a privilege for us to walk with you through this conversation. We can talk down front if you're here in the room, if you're online, uh, you can hit the prayer button on Port City TV, you can go to the Connect card, you can go to our website, really anything at all, we would love to talk with you. Uh, for everybody watching online, I'd love to send you out to Brett in the atrium for some next steps to kind of end our time together today. Oh, wow. So, uh, hey, good morning, guys. Thank you so much for being with us. Um, man, Sass, uh, great message by him. Um, if there's any way that we can um, walk with you as you're processing this, uh, this, these messages about kind of the baggage that's been packed um, for you um, in your life, maybe some things that you're carrying that you'd like to lay down, some burdens that you're dealing with, um, please make sure you go to our Connect card. It's portcity.church slash connect. Um, it's a way for us to come alongside of you. If you need prayer, if you need help, if you need to connect with somebody in some way, uh, we would love to be able to do that. Um, if you're a parent and you need help uh, processing um, how to uh, make sure you're not packing bags in your kids' lives, I mean, just we want to partner with you as a church and as a family, so please let us know how we can do that. Um, it, we want to remind you... Um, about our giving, um, the link to give. Um, it's portcity.church slash give. Um, it's a way for you to connect and partner with us in the ministries that are happening um, here. Don't forget that we do have an app uh, that you can take advantage of. Uh, go to uh, the Google Store or to um, the uh, wherever you have your apps, uh, download, here you go, QR code. You can get the link there. It's a great way for us to be able to continue to be involved in your life during the week. Um, it's a way for you to go back and listen to the message, um, find previous messages, um, and we can also send out um, notifications to you based on your interests and where you are in your life. So make sure you, if you don't have the app yet, uh, make sure you get it and connect with us in that way. Um, and last but not least, um, if you are watching this live on Sunday morning, we just want to remind you that there is no 5 o'clock service tonight. Um, it is the 4th of July, and we know that everybody's going to be having family and friends plans. And um, if you know of people who typically attend the 5 o'clock service, just send them a quick text and remind them that there will not be a 5 o'clock service, and there will be no fireworks in the parking lot that will be able to kind of keep them entertained, even though there's not church. Um, so just make sure you guys know that. Um, and um, again, just really grateful that you guys are with us online um, and uh, participate in the church uh, by watching and being a part of our community in this way. We hope that you've enjoyed your time with us this morning. We hope that you've been challenged. We hope that um, that the Holy Spirit has maybe been working in your heart through the worship or through the communicator, through SAS and what he talked about today. And again, if there's anything that we can do as a church to come alongside of you and be your church, 
please let us know how we can do that at portcity.church slash connect. Again, my name is Brett. Um, thank you guys so much for being with us, and we will see you again shortly, um, next week even. All right? See you then. Thanks. Bye. Bye.